Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Brian and Jack from Simple Man's Comics, where we're helping to amplify your comic book collection through integrity and community. We do a lot of comic book and pop culture related content on this channel. So if you're new here, consider subscribing. We have a fantastic show for you tonight. We have a creator spotlight from an image comic that is coming out this week, this very Wednesday, this new comic book day. But I'm going to let Jack tell you about it and who we have as our guest tonight. That's right. Welcome, Simple Moons Comics family. Jack DeMeo, a.k.a. Mr. Bolo here. And we've got a real rare treat. We have got a creator, Sean Kittleson, from an image skybound imprint with his new book, Heart Attack. And it's a rare opportunity to do a creator spotlight on a book that is on this week's Bolo list. Sean, what's going on, buddy? Howdy, guys. Good to be here. Right. So, Sean... Heart Attack it's from Image Comics is from their Skybound imprint, right? So mm -hmm. before we get into that comic book, why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about yourself, a little bit about the work you've done, kind of let them know who you are before we get into this kick-ass book that's coming out this week. Sure. So I am probably best known as a video game writer uh, for my work as narrative lead and co-writer on Injustice 2 and Mortal Kombat 11. Uh, and if, if you're enjoying those games or you have enjoyed those games, uh, then, then I think you will find Heart Attack is something different, but of a high quality, <laughs> nonetheless. Um, I have written comics before. I wrote the Mortal Kombat X uh, series for DC. Uh, I did a graphic novel called Savage Game for uh, Amazon and Comixology. Um, but for the most part, I've been writing games uh, the last like five years uh, have been almost exclusively games. So this is my first uh, original series co-created with uh, Eric Zavadsky. And uh, I am super stoked for it to come out. It's been a long time in the making. Uh, I've seen so many ups and downs in my own career that this, this story has kind of been on with me. So this is my first time coming out though with something that's not a license, it's not superheroes, it's not uh, big big fighting in action. It's something a lot more personal and a uh, little, little bit more closer to the ground, I guess, than some of the bigger, more epic stuff that I'm, I'm known for working on. I think it's great because if you're a fan of comics, a lot of times you're a fan of video games, so there's a lot of synergy there, using big oh, words yeah. now, but... Um, I mean, that's... That's where, uh, that's actually where, like how I got started. Like I, I got into, most people go from like, you know, something else uh, into, into games or something. But I actually was trying to get into comics and accidentally found myself in games. Um, back in 2009, so like 10 years ago, uh, I, was, I was desperate, desperate to work at DC Comics. I was a huge Superman fan. And I ended up getting a job as the assistant editor for the interactive department. And that, that was my first job in games. That led to me making all the, the contacts that I've uh, I built my career on. And uh, that's, I guess, even how I'm here today. I, I, I met Sean Makowitz, who's now the editor in chief uh, at, at Skybound. Uh, when he and I were both assistant editors, uh, lowly, lowly assistant editors in the bullpen back at DC, New York, when the offices were still there. So my video game career, my comics career, are like this <laughs> in a lot of ways, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't be working in games if I wasn't so, such a big fan of, of comics. Well, and I can't think of two games that are more synonymous, I think, with comic book culture and comic book fandom than Mortal Kombat and Injustice. I mean, that's about as big as it gets. And you mentioned uh, Mortal Kombat X. Uh, that was a very, very popular book in the comic community. Uh, even those issue number ones, I remember at one point, uh, were selling for well above cover price and were yeah. extremely popular. Um, so th I think that's kind of cool. I think a lot of people may not realize that they are actually familiar with you from that. Yeah, that, I mean, I, the Mortal Kombat X comics were a really interesting learning experience for me because I, I got to work on this big epic series with um, some developers who I'd, I'd worked with, uh, the team at NetherRealm on uh, Injustice, Gods Among Us, back when I was at DC. So I had this relationship with them, but I was really unproven as a comics writer and I kind of came in like under the radar uh, with a pitch for, for the series because uh, I loved 
MK so much and I grew up as a cake kid. Uh, so that, that book though, what I learned from that book and one of the, the key takeaways for me from, from writing that series was you know, I was writing, I was doing a good job at addressing things that the fans really wanted to see. And a lot of that was because I'm a big MK fan, right? And there were things from like the 3D era of MK games, the early 2000s MK games that were really important to me and precious to me. And so I, I infused those into the book and that made it, uh, kind of like a, it was a cult hit among the MK fans. Like it, it, it served the MK fan base in a way that they hadn't been served in a long, long time. Uh, but what I sort of got bitten by a little bit was the perception that the book was not, uh, didn't cast a, a wide enough net for casual readers. So it became this thing where DC would kind of tell me like, nah, the book's not doing as well as it should. And I'd be like, I just, I just got a royalty statement that said it's you know volume one sold over a hundred thousand <laughs> in trade like what, what do you mean it's not doing good enough they're like oh well you know there's so much digital and that's trade and we're looking at the monthlies and so i learned a bit about the business of how like all right if there's if there is a perception that something is not a mainstream success uh in comics or that it's not a success on wednesday at the shop uh that the book is kind of doa but the book actually did really really well uh, sales wise right so in this comics family they know i'm a big licensed property fan um and i think when whether it's ninja turtles or power rangers or any of these like licensed properties that most of us grew up on and mortal Kombat is as synonymous with those as anything i as a fan appreciate a writer who goes and tries to maybe answer those questions we didn't get answered or touch on subjects that maybe we wish they went more into i think that's been sort of the success in the recent power ranger series that we've seen oh yeah you can tell it's written by power ranger fans who are telling stories that we've always been kind of curious about so i can appreciate what you're saying as soon as you said that i, I kind of it hit me because i was like well i you know i grew up playing mortal Kombat, but maybe i'm not the biggest diehard but i can appreciate if i was a, one of those like real diehards how that series would connect and i think that that you know it's unfortunate how sometimes the business side gets in the way of that yeah well it was it was a weird time for dc too because i think the uh, and it's still a weird time in that print and digital are, are in this weird place where i feel like the big two they don't really they don't really know how to play it right like like so that you've seen all these experiments whether it's you know marvel unlimited or uh, the stuff that's on the DC Universe app now, but like this is sort of like, like, where's the line? Are we cannibalizing print sales with digital? Or are we supplementing them? And you know, I think you know, if I could could change anything about the way that MKX was released, I, I would probably get the print schedule in closer step with the digital schedule because it did feel like there was just too much time elapsing that the books were out in digital. Uh, before it would go to print. And so you'd get sort of a softer response, I think, on the monthly issues. But that did make things like MKX number one, where we had like a couple of different, we had the Scorpion and Sub-Zero variant covers. We had like a, a black and white versions of each and stuff. And like those, those, those are still selling <laughs> well above rate. That's kind of cool to see, but like, ah, we did something. We left something that's like valuable and, and there's, there's treasure to it it's even beyond the nostalgia factor it's like if you have this number one and and you've got it like it's it's a special object now which that's cool I mean, back in the day when uh i remember kyle higgins was starting on power rangers and i was talking to him and i was like i can't believe like look at us couple of 90s kids right in mortal Kombat and power rangers now like putting putting the things that we couldn't see on our tvs when we were kids into these books that's uh, pretty awesome i feel very grateful and fortunate to have that that experience so you mentioned about how dc judged the success of your book and i think that's one of the problems that i have especially in the industry especially with this big two is Sometimes success isn't measured from bean counting. Yeah. <laughs> right. Which kind of segues us over here with your new book that's coming out this week. It's called Heart Attack, right? Mm -hmm. It's from Image with Skybound. So how do you feel? Is it a breath of fresh air going over to something like this creator-owned type content? It's, well, I'll, I'll say this. It, it challenged me. 
Uh, and that's, so I, I, you know, I made the pitch and uh, Skybound, Skybound bought the pitch, said, okay, we're, let's, let's write six issues and get an artist and, and build this up. And I wrote, I actually wrote the first six issues and then got a phone call from Skybound asking if I would be interested in writing three of those six issues over again. And I was like taken aback. I was like, what do you mean? I, I mean, is this not, you know, are these scripts not conforming to the outlines? Like we had a whole series of development and approval discussions before I wrote things. Like, how did we get here? And one of the weirder things, and this is again why I would credit Skybound with, they said, no, actually you wrote exactly what you said you write in the outline. However, uh, the first few issues felt a lot more intimate and personal and focused, you know, on these characters. And it seems like it got bigger and it's starting to turn into this bigger blockbuster thing uh, as we get towards the end of the first arc. And what if, you know, is there an approach that you, you would take where instead of going in that big bombastic direction, we went with something a little bit smaller, more grounded. And I kind of took that in and thought like, wow, this is counterintuitive to the advice that you get like when you're working on a big two book where it's like, make it as big as possible, widescreen, splash page, double page spread, like, like give us, give us the biggest possible thing and make sure that cliffhanger is just like, pam, pow, cliffhangers. And here's the opposite advice, like slow it down. <laughs> give us, give us longer conversations with the characters, give us more time, you know, alone with the characters to, to get to feel their performances and their emotions. And so I kind of had to unlearn some of the like like big two thinking that I think I had uh, I had I had too much of it over too many years, and I had to find a new way to to enjoy comics again. I almost feel like my favorite big two books now, and the things that you see popping, like like Tom King's work on on uh, on Vision and stuff, are these things that do challenge <laughs> those those ideas about like what a comic should be. And it kind of goes back to not to make it a creator rant, but but that there's a there's a certain sense that like just do what we did before that worked before that never delivers the same results that you get from someone being like I'm excited about something because I haven't seen it before or I'm excited about this because I don't see a lot of this in the market and you know I hope that's that's what we've tried to create with Heart Attack is a superhero ish book that is not really a, a superhero book it's it's a much more human book. Yeah, well, I think we can relate to that even as YouTube content creators, where we have to almost sometimes keep ourselves insular and not pay attention to what everyone else is doing um, for a few reasons to be one, to be inspired, to make sure that we're doing content that we truly want to do. Um, and secondly, to make sure that we are doing things that are different and that aren't just kind of carbon copies, because you see a lot of that, um, I think, in every form of media where somebody else is just trying to make the next this or the next that. And you, know, you always want to kind of have that, that different edge. And then if you feel like you're doing something that is at least creative, if it doesn't work, you can still feel good about it regardless of the success because you had ownership in the creation of that yeah. property. Um, but now let's get into, let's get into the book. Let's talk about the book. The characters in this story, you bring a lot of heart to them. Um, Give us kind of a rundown on our, our kind of our, our main players in this book. So the, the two main characters are, are Jill Kearney and Charlie North. Uh, and they are two teenagers in a near future Austin where uh, in this near future, disease has been all but eradicated by genetic editing therapies. So things like the, the CRISPR-Cas9 and stuff like that. Uh, have have been commercialized and commodified, and actually, you know, used to stop a great epidemic. The problem is uh, now that all this disease and, and illness has been you know wiped out, uh, there's always a there's always a downside, and the the sort of downside or the complication is that the children of the first patients who receive these genetic treatments end up a little bit mutated their DNA is not quite human. Uh, so they're called variants. They have, they have variant DNA. It's human enough, but not human enough to qualify them as human beings, at least in the eyes of the, the government. So Charlie and Jill meet 
in near future Austin. They are two young variants. Uh, they are they are resisting uh, this authoritarian police force called the Variant Crimes Unit that is really cracking down and is literally kidnapping variants off the street and they disappear and they're never heard from again and they're falling into some legal gray area and government loopholes where they just can kind of be uh, be abducted and, and disappear and never never be seen again. Uh, and in the midst of all this, and it's a lot of like run up, uh, the thing is, there's this fear that variants have powers like X-Men, uh, that they are they could have powers of mass destruction or PMDs. And the truth is, in this world, there really aren't powers of mass destruction. It's not cosmic level powers. Uh, there is no, there could never be <laughs> a House of X and powers of 10 <laughs> in this universe. It's just, it couldn't happen. There's no, there's no more McTaggart to, to resurrect over and over again. Uh, but Charlie and Jill find that when they touch, uh, they unlock some powers that are a little bit more super than the grounded types of variations that we see in a lot of the, these variant teenagers. So you've got these two people who actually have very different views on the fight for variant rights and have very different, uh, you know, goals in mind when, when they meet each other. Uh, but they're drawn together by this connection they have whenever they touch. And it leads them into a place of uh, not only trying to uh, challenge the authorities and, and rebel and you know, all that romantic uprising stuff, but it actually leads them to this place where they have to understand each other. You know, the, the name Heart Attack or the title Heart Attack is uh, a reference to the fact that if you're, if you're going to hurt somebody, it's not really the political or larger issues that, that are the things that hurt. It's the emotional matters and the matters of heart where, where you'll hurt them the most. And so Charlie and Jill, once they discover that they have this connection, it becomes this game of sort of these two strangers trying to figure out if they can trust each other, if they can open up to each other, if they can really rely on each other. Charlie is a person who believes that you shouldn't trust anybody. Jill is a person who has a really tight group of friends and family that she keeps really close and dear and she would do anything for them because she trusts them implicitly. So, whoops, hit my desk. So it's kind of a, it's a story about two people who are bound together by this almost cosmic strange coincidence, uh, but are dealing with these very human issues of trust and uh, fear and how much should you rely on another person versus how much do you just make your own way, even if you know that that's going to come at a cost. Lots going on. It's a, <laughs> I probably think I should probably come up with a faster elevator pitch for it. <laughs> no, I, so full disclosure, uh, Sean did send us advanced copies to read before this video. So we both, Jack and I had a chance to read it and you shoot it right out the gate that both of them are variants. When I was reading the book, it kind of didn't play out that way. It looked like she was one and he was just a bystander and it kind of disclosed it a little bit later on. So, um, but when you mentioned how they touched, I love the art that was portrayed in the comic book of how when they touched all the different senses and everything that's going on right now. We talk in the comic book community a lot about variant hunting, but it's a whole different meaning from the variant hunting that's going on in this comic book. Yeah. Yeah, we've heard this uh, this book compared to X Men or Runaways. To me, it strikes a lot of Cloak and Dagger. It has that kind mm. of feeling about two characters who kind of, when they connect, their powers become greater than they were individually. And then, like you brought up, that whole issue, um, especially uh, with the main the main character, he obviously, like you mentioned, you know, without giving too much away. Um, because of his life circumstance, he's, he's not as trusting. To me, the, the kind of scene, the area of the book, the first issue, where you see it the most is when he's in the nightclub. Mm. And he's so uncomfortable, and it's not his scene. And he even mentions at that point that, um, you know, he almost downgrades his own ability, right? That he says, yeah. you know, I, I don't have um, powers that anybody would, would care about or pay attention to. And then he finds out later on that, well, actually, that's not really the case um, when he's connected to this woman. 
So I think that, that his character I found very um, kind of intriguing where it's like you, you, a lot of times you get these kind of main characters where they're very, um, they're, you know, there's an arrogance or you know, yeah. they command attention right off the bat. And I like the fact that you get kind of a different approach with him where he's, he's, he's taken aback more. Um, right when the book starts, he, it doesn't appear that he's going to be the one you're following, right? right? There's, yeah. uh, there's another character, Nora, who seems to be more um, who we're going to be focused on. And that changes really kind of quickly. So yeah. um, I, I really think that the, the first issue does a great job kind of giving us an idea of who he is and um, leaves you wondering where we're going to go beyond that first issue. Well, thank you. I, I think that, you know, the Charlie is every character in the book in some way, you know, sprang as a little bit of an avatar of some facet of, of personality that I feel like, like I could invest myself in. So I think Jill is the side of myself that's very outgoing and doesn't mind getting on camera and doing an interview <laughs> and, and, you know, can, can work a room. And I used to be a pitch man for an ad agency. So I, I know, and I have a certain like sense of like, Oh, I can do the marketing thing. I can be buzzy and, and commercial and I can, I can do that. But then there's another part of me that's way more Charlie <laughs> that just wants to go home and kind of be alone or like I show up at a club and the music is so loud and I'm like, nobody cares what I, what I have to say. Why, why am I here? And I think we've all had, you know, both sides of that. There are days where we feel like stepping into the spotlight and, and being that confident person that can take on the world. But then there's a lot of days where most of us would, would rather that spotlight went somewhere else uh, and not on us and we could kind of go do our own thing and take care of ourselves. Um, and that's something that to me like was really important because like you said, I feel like you get a lot of brash, confident leads <laughs> in yeah. comics. Uh, and to me, even the brash and confident people are like crippled by insecurity privately. So I, I wanted to, I wanted to represent that. And I also wanted to, to have a, as a, as a, as a lead, Charlie can be criticized for being like, Oh, that he's so beta, but like, that is kind of who he is. Like he, he is someone who he's not really looking to be an alpha position and he's not really looking to, to contend with anyone or compete with anyone. He's just looking for a quiet place all his own in a world that's gotten really noisy and uh, full of conflict. And I think because of that personality on the first few pages of the comic, you don't see him as the protagonist. You see her as the mm -hmm. protagonist and that yeah. kind of just flips within the few, first few pages and they're like, oh, okay. And like he said, the, the, the nightclub, um, I don't want to talk too much. I mean, one of the viewers know about the book, but don't want to give the book away also. I, know, I, can, I, I don't want to spoil it. I, I've written up through, uh, I'm working on issue 12 now. So uh, it's going to be real hard for me not to just spoil the entire arc. So without <laughs> spoiling it, let the viewers know through those 12 issues kind of what the the copy would be in a preview for say a, the trade paperback i think it would be um you know we we meet charlie and jill and they have this unique circumstance and they, they live in this world that you know we don't there's never an expo dump where like on page one someone's like here's how we got to this near future gang <laughs> uh, 17 uh, word bubbles <laughs> yeah yeah i didn't want to do that i mean we have we're, we're actually we're investing in putting a lot of back matter into to every single issue we're going to have some kind of custom like ephemera from the world that will help fill in some of the lore uh, and mythology like behind like well what happened between today and this near future but the focus is on Charlie and Jill. So the, the larger overall story is when these two people in these really desperate circumstances where they're literally like their kind are being kidnapped off the street by state sanctioned uh, authorities, um, you know, how do they stand up to it? And, you know, how do they, how do they deal with the fact that they have this power? If you, if you're accustomed to being powerless and you suddenly get power, it sounds like a great idea, but it's actually full of all of these 
potential dangers and risks that you that you bring upon yourself. So you've got Charlie and Jill who both have very different approaches to those risks negotiating with each other constantly and it's kind of a question of like can they pull themselves together enough to do something good for their community uh, or you know will the things that they try to do backfire and have consequences for for the people in that community will uh, they they break each other's hearts and betray each other and disappoint each other in ways that make it impossible for them to work together for for the greater good um, so the book is really about you know, how you're tested, even when you know that you have a good cause, even when you know that you have the power to change something, it's not easy to make change. And it's not easy to be, uh, to be, to be active and vocal in, in a system that, that would really just rather keep you down. Kind of like working in comics. <laughs> I'm kidding, kidding. Comics aren't so bad. It's a lot harder. And, and, uh, I would say, I would say I've, I've enjoyed working on this book as much or more than I've enjoyed working on anything else I've ever worked on. Uh, Cause I think that the, the creative opportunity is so, so huge to do something that, that just honestly that nobody cares about yet. Like there's uh, so much of my work has been about dealing with the expectations of fans of injustice or mortal Kombat, And uh, you know, I think I've made a career out of, really loving the fans of the things that I love and wanting to write a love letter to those fans. And I would definitely call my work on, on the games like, yeah, Injustice 2 is my love letter to Superman fans and DC fans. It's, it's someone who loves Superman enough to name his son Clark and get a Superman tattoo on my shoulder, uh, taking the care to make sure that the villainous Superman is portrayed in the most authentic way possible and that Supergirl is there to, to be that voice. None of those expectations follow me to heart attack, which almost puts a different kind of pressure on you to say, okay, let's make something worthy of, of people being fans of it. And I think I, my initial, like I said, I did those first six issues and I think I was in my own head about trying to create something that looked like the things that I was a fan of. And then when I, you know, rebroke the issues and rewrote them, uh, it ended up becoming a completely, a completely different type of story than I think I would have written if I were aiming for that goal of that, like, I want to make fans feel this way. Instead, it was like, no, oh, I just want to feel, I want to make myself feel a certain way. I want to make my editors feel this way. I'm not going to think about this bigger fan community yet because it doesn't exist for the book. So let's create something new and different and interesting to us and then put it out there and see if the fans want to want to join us. Imagine it'd be daunting yet refreshing going from writing DC where you have kind of a built-in fan base to going and creating something from your own. The refreshing part and the daunting part is there's expectations already there. Yeah. Because they're expecting something from that character. They're expecting you to deliver on it. But that can also be refreshing when you go over there creating something from scratch. You don't have a grown-in fan base. So you can kind of just create your own world and then and write to fans, like you said, your love letter type and pour your heart out and just grow that your own story. Yeah, no, it, it, it's funny. Cause like when I started getting art back from Eric, I remember thinking like, I should have more notes on this, but I really, and I, I mean this wholeheartedly, I share this book with Eric Zabotsky, like, it's his as much as mine. I might have pitched it in, but it wouldn't be what it is without him. Uh, and he brought things to life. In some ways, it's like he brought things to life that were were straight out of my brain. Like I, like he reached in there and pulled it out and put it on paper in a way I never could. And then there are other things that he's done with the book in terms of the performances, or uh, he's he's got this incredible eye for layouts that I think I really I. I I would put him up there and this is, I'm fully biased, obviously, but I feel like he is someone who uh, over the next few years should be blowing up. Uh, Eric deserves to be a superstar. I won't say this about myself. I don't believe this about myself too insecure for that, 
But I will say like, I've met someone in Eric who is such a great creative partner that there is no one I would rather have draw a script. And if I could have him draw everything I write for the rest of my life, I, I would. Uh, but he's, he's that good. Uh, and that's been a real, real pleasure of working on it. Well, that's just the Charlie and you saying that. That's all that is. But, <laughs> but as, a, as a new, one of your new Heart Attack fans, I'll say that the, one of the, the kind of like, I think it's going to be a theme. Obviously, we've only read issue one. So um, kind of that reminds me of kind of the X-Men and why I love the X-Men um, is the way that kind of the variants are immediately in a tough position where they're almost minorities within their own kind of culture and world. And you start to see the interaction that happens when you have um, kind of those minorities not have the power. Not, I mean, obviously they have physical power, but they don't have the power within, um, within society. And you have this police force that essentially can kind of, overstep bounds and do what they want and are profiling and um, it immediately puts these kind of kids in this tough position where they've got to live in this world looking over their shoulder and I mean you see an instance early in the book where they're clearly using powers in public and then you see an instance later on where there's a kid you don't know if that's what he's doing and yet he's still getting kind of put into that position Um, and, and it kind of forces our heroes to be heroes and I, I think that that is something that will, to kind of like, for my elevator pitch to the book, I think if you're where we always talk about, um, you know, you hear this a lot, this book's like the X-Men, this book's like the X-Men, but th- that from an emotional standpoint to me is what uh-huh. connects like the X-Men, where it's like immediately you get this feeling of, well, these characters, they're living in this large world and they're almost not safe in their own in their own world, yeah. even though they're some of the, per se, the stronger people. Yeah. And that's, uh, to me, that's kind of the, uh, I really appreciate you saying that. Uh, the, the feeling that I think that, that I wanted to come across and, and, you know, they, they, the variants are a minority in this future, but there's also a very specific reason why they are based in, in East Austin. Uh, there's a wall that's dividing Austin. Uh, it runs along what's currently uh, Interstate 35. Um, and if you if you know your Austin history, uh, then that you know that that demarcation line where we put the wall in our book is actually the same line that was used to segregate Austin uh, and create a quote unquote Negro district during the Jim Crow era. Um, there was a point where Austin was was too integrated uh, for for the white folks, and so it's because they couldn't uh, do certain things as a result of post Civil War Reconstruction era laws. Uh, they decided to shut down all the municipal services on the west side and in any of the black neighborhoods. So if you're in a black neighborhood and you want to send your kid to school, you got to send them to the east side of Austin, uh, and that slowly changed the makeup demogra- the demography of Austin, Texas to have this hyper segregated, literally you could see the line and then here's, here's where all the black uh, people live in Austin. Um, that situation has gotten so dramatically complicated in our time by gentrification and the issues that come with urban renewal. And so as a background of our book, like we, we basically set it in East Austin. There's this wall there that literally puts up the barrier that, that so many policies and, and uh, segregationists uh, implemented years ago. Uh, and the population of variants that is there are there because uh, they are the kids of the people who couldn't afford the good genetic treatments. And it turns out the cheaper ones are the ones that would make you a variant. So some of this, this is a lot of backstory and I'm always happy to give that away because I feel like that's not going to spoil the, the character stuff. But, you know, it's, there's a lot of history invested into where the characters come from and, and why they're in Austin. So I like that you provide the backstory because it even provided more context to me having read the book. You can't help, I think, anytime you read a book, especially when it's issue number one, when you're not really 
have an idea of what the story's about. As you're reading it in your mind, you automatically relate it to something that you know already. Yeah. And you have talked about how you refer to X-Men, which is, I mean, that's, you can't help but because you're talking about almost like a variant or a mutation. Yeah. Reading it also without giving too much away, there's an influencer in there. And as I was reading this book, there's, it reminded me of, there's an old 90s Christian Slater movie called Pump Up the Volume. Oh, yeah. And it, <laughs> it, it, on a very small scale, it reminded me of this because it, it was like that youth evolution. Um, you could see that starting to build in here. And then with her being the influencer um, and then the scene in the, the, the club, uh, I had that kind of feel to it where it was like the indie punk, but I wanted to see where it went within issue one kind of world setting there but yeah that was the image that came into my head on top of the x-men similarities and stuff like that oh, that's a great one no no one's come in with pump up the volume yet so that's 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 delightful i think Lisa was a 90s movie right was yeah because i'm always an 80s movie guy <laughs> yeah i was gonna say brian's always hitting those 80s references oh uh, man well, Lisa welcome, like a well, john hughes film or something Nah, man, welcome to the 90s. I mean, I, there's a lot of, I'm a big 90s fan, probably because that was my formative era. And that's one of the reasons why Charlie says in the book that like he, he has this kind of moment where he passionately defends 90s culture as like the high point of American pop culture. And I don't know that I agree with him that it was the high point, but it was a high point. 90s was pretty dope. Uh, but yeah, I think... Um, you know, the, the, the influencer angle of it and kind of like taking, so taking the resistance movement that we call the free bodies. So the variants that are, you know, protesting and, and, uh, and advocating for, for human rights, basically for, for variants. Um, I, this book is probably going to get attacked uh, by people as being like a leftist, uh, manifesto, but, uh, I consider myself a humanist, uh, and although I think that that you know right wing extremism is a major problem in the United States that we really need to to address, um, I also think that it, it's really easy to look at the other side and point out all their flaws, and then look at your side and create this hagiographic, perfect uh, version of of uh, of what uh, the more sympathetic side is, and that's why. I, it was really important to me in this book that we never treat characters as heroes and villains. Um, I mean, the, the theme of Injustice 2 was every, every villain is the hero of their own story. Uh, I would you know, take that further and say everyone is the hero of their own story. And that's how we try to approach it so that you've got you know, this authoritarian police force, but as we'll see, especially as the book continues, like there's human beings <laughs> behind those masks, Captain Raymond Rees, who's, uh, who's, who's the captain of the VCU, uh, he's, he's a complex individual and not just a, an arch villain. And likewise, like the good guys are not just motivated by altruistic uh, intentions all the time. Like the free bodies and their, their leader, Sefton Smith, he, he's an ardent capitalist. And so a lot of what he's created isn't as much a political movement or a protest movement as much as it's a lifestyle brand and having a character who could be at the forefront of that lifestyle brand and be an influencer but also be somewhat conflicted about playing that role in the movement as opposed to playing a, a role that's making real change for people that isn't selling t-shirts and concert tickets um, that was kind of my uh, hopefully my, my olive branch <laughs> to, to people who, who aren't of the same political persuasion and say like, I'm not saying we're all saints. Uh, I think, I think they're every, every human being is deeply flawed. And the more that we recognize that, the more we can tell these stories with characters who aren't perfect or like so calculated in their imperfection that it's like, and they've got one flaw and if they just fix it, they'll be the greatest person ever. Uh, I, I think people are far more complicated than that. And hopefully like the organizations too, like, you know, don't believe in movements, you know, believe, believe in individuals and, and in your own ability to come together with other individuals to do something greater. Now you brought up um, the captain. Um, mm -hmm. What issue do we meet him? 
Uh, he shows up. So he's he's the guy who shows up in issue one. Um, or no, wait, he doesn't show up in issue one. That's why. I, okay, that's why I was bringing I'm this tripping up. Now. <laughs> that's why I was bringing this up. I, I was yeah. like, let me make sure I didn't miss this. I didn't think he did. Oh I'm no. Gonna use, I'm going to use this as a selling point to Simpleman's Comics family here. We talk about this with independent comics guys. A lot of times we as like a secondary market and a collector market, we tend to jump on issue one, Mm -hmm. buy up issue one. And we don't always, if you're not a reader, you're not always paying attention to those other issues. But one thing that gets missed a lot of times is first appearances beyond issue one. So it sounds like our big, one of our big characters, we're not going to meet until a later issue. And that is something to be on the lookout. Yeah, no, we we meet uh, Captain Reese. You're uh, you you meet him in the very first pages of issue two, uh, and we have a couple of key characters who get introduced as the series goes on. And that was kind of something that you know I I, I never wanted to. Um, it's not a TV show, right? So I don't have to worry about just having my principles, and then I, I bring a guest star in and get rid of them. Uh, we can introduce people in a more gradual way. So I can actually say that across the book, um, there's a there's a really pivotal character in the second arc that you don't even meet uh, in issues one through six. And this character's kind of spoken about, gets a, a shout out in issue two, but like you don't meet this this person until uh, issue seven or eight. And I think it's it's keeping those surprises coming uh, is really, really important, but also, you know, not giving the reader the sense that because they haven't met someone or because they meet someone in issue four, that that person may not be a major player. Like for that person can be a major player. Yeah, so listen to that collectors. If this gets optioned at some point, you need to be paying attention to issue one, issue two, we got at least another issue, seven or eight. So that's something, that's something to be on the lookout for that. That's pretty cool. And I like that. I definitely like that. That's something that I think that, still the collecting community and the secondary market community um, sometimes misses out on when it comes to independent properties. Oh yeah. Well, I think, I think that's part of the, uh, it, some stories can be so self-contained that it's to their detriment that they box themselves in and everything has to be really tight and really neat. And I think that uh, we don't want our story to be messy and, and feel sloppy, but we also want our story to feel surprising and, we don't want to fall into a routine. I think that you know, one of the things that I've, I've really thought a lot about is, you know, what, is, this a, is this a political book or is it a love story? And I sort of come down on the side of like, it's not really a political book. It's a politically informed book, but it's a love story. So every issue, if it doesn't relate in some way back to Charlie and Jill and their love story, then, then what are we doing? Like, are we, are we just spinning wheels? Uh, so every, every turn has to complicate uh, that relationship, but around that we can build. And that means that we can go out and we can meet new characters. We can see other, other uh, areas of this world and, and the variant rights movement and the, the VCU. And kind of shining that different spotlight helps illuminate the main characters and provide more context for why they're doing what they're doing. But we don't have to just, just because we're doing the grounded book, we don't have to lock it down and we don't have to sprawl as big as a big two epic, but we can find a, a comfortable middle place where we can still pack those surprises in and give the collectors something that, that's valuable along the way and not just an issue one. So another thing I noticed with this book is you're donating the proceeds through for the print copies of this through issues one through 12, right? Yep. I am, uh, so the book, I mean, the book deals with, uh issues that are closely related and drawn from uh the real life movement for criminal justice reform in the united states Uh, it's a it's an issue that is uh near and dear to my heart insofar as i I genuinely believe in the words of uh run the jewels rapper killer mike uh who has said you know what your government is willing to do to the least of us that will someday do to all of us and i i think that it was for me, uh, as, a, as a white cis male in 2019, to write my woke political book uh, and to profit from it felt wrong. Uh, and, and I'd love for the book to, to do big business and to, to make lots of money for people involved. But I've been very fortunate to have the career that I have in games 
and I thought long and hard about, you know, this book is going to be a smaller thing than, than Mortal Kombat, right? And there's no, there's no universe where Heart Attack number one, they're not going to print enough copies to sell, uh, sell Mortal Kombat numbers. However, um, maybe there's something I can do that's bigger than, than the things that I've been able to do or that's different, that leaves a different impact than the things I've been able to do on these big budget games. Uh, so donating uh, any, any royalties that I receive, and I'll probably roll digital into that as well. So any, any royalties and proceeds I receive from uh, issues one through 12 in the first year, uh, I will donate to the Southern Poverty Law Center. And I've actually uh, been, uh, been matched now by uh, the IE Law Group and uh, my attorney, Patrick Sweeney, uh, who will be joining. So any donations that come in for me, uh, they will match double up to a certain percentage, uh, which is pretty exciting. Like that, to put that out there, and that just, I just put that out there uh, on, you know, a few days ago, and I got this text message saying like, hey, you know, can we match you? And I was like, this is, this is awesome. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, I'm very excited to be able to say that, you know, I wrote this book about people who want to make a difference and hopefully, uh, a little bit of this book can make a difference for some people who really need it. Uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, represents, uh, uh, poor and, uh, disenfranchised people who are unable to defend themselves, uh, against the American legal system. And uh, as a result, I, I feel like, you know, the Southern Poverty Law Center are real heroes. The Free Bodies are this branded movement that talks about being heroes. And Charlie and Jill are on this mission to figure out what it means to be real heroes in the book. Uh, so why not try to give back to the people who are doing that in real life? If you really want to support the book, One Stop, <laughs> the One Stop Shop for Comics and Games has this exclusive variant, uh, beautifully drawn by Eric Savodsky. Uh, if you like beautiful books, this one, I, I'm, I'm framing this. This is the next time you see this room, it hopefully will be back there on the wall in a frame. Um, but I think that we've got one of the best teams uh, in comics between uh, Eric, uh, Michael Garland, who did Colors, uh, Pat Brousseau, Who's I've known Pat since we both worked at DC back in the back in the old days when DC was still in New York. Gosh, I miss that building sometimes. I get nostalgia for it. But to be working with Pat like years later and, and have him on this book is, is super special for me. Um, and shout outs to John Moisen, our editor uh, at Skybound, to Sean Makowitz and Ariel Bassage, who also uh, have helped us out at Skybound. And to uh, Andres Juarez and Karina Taylor, who uh, designed the book and logo and all the back matter that you'll find in the book. Uh, they're incredible graphic designers, and uh, without their work, uh, the book wouldn't look uh, wouldn't look as slick as uh, as it does. So I'm super appreciative to the whole team. Nobody makes a comic on their own, except for a few crazy people out there. <laughs> and as you mentioned, Sean, that's that is the only variant for issue number one. Yes. Correct? One and only. So this is it. Uh, I have a feeling, I, if, I wouldn't be surprised if this one starts going for more like the day after uh, sale, just because it's the only one. Uh, and it's, to me, it's a really spectacular piece of art. Uh, so I'm excited to see, uh, see fans picking it up. Well, shout out to One Stop Shop Comics, uh, up in a small shop up in Massachusetts, who was a really good eye for independent comics. They do a great job with some of these exclusive variants with some independent titles. And we always appreciate retailers who want to shine a light on creator-driven books, and especially a book like yours, where you're going to do so much for some people who could really use some help. So I think that's really awesome. And I, I love what you said about the, uh, the, the donation of money, just the unselfish nature of it. So um, I know you said you, you're good with the video games thing, man, but I hope still hope this thing gets optioned for you one day or something. Hey, so, yeah. You no, know, man, you, uh, you, you know, can... it's funny. People people think, they're like, oh, you wrote Mortal Kombat. You must be rich. And I'm like, ah, I didn't write that under a Writer's Guild contract. There's no, there's no royalties. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I will actually... I stand to make more money on heart attack uh, potentially than I, than I've made in games. But, uh, but this is, like I said, 
how often do you get to do something like I think it's really cool when you get to marry your your professional life with the things that you feel personally and ethically uh, drawn to and so I think more so than just making one donation or or uh, like hosting a drive like why not just say hey I'm dedicating this book to the causes that it's about that's awesome. So everybody, be on the lookout. Heart Attack number one hits shelves this Wednesday for New Comic Book Day. We're talking November the 20th. And a little sneak peek, since this is Tuesday when this is premiering, this book will be featured on the Mr. Bolo Bolo list. It's under the Reader Buzz section. So be sure to be on the lookout for it when it hits your shops. We're talking only one cover at your main uh, comic shops. So be on the lookout for that and be on the lookout for when we bring Sean back with Eric Swadsky. Is that how you pronounce his name? Zavadsky. Zavadsky. Um, when we bring him back on here later on, we're going to, we're going to bring them both on, kind of do an update talk. We can talk a little bit more about the story and talk about some of those new characters uh, that will be appearing later on. So be on the lookout for that future episode. This is only part one. We are going to have more heart attack down the road on the Simple News Comics YouTube channel. Stay tuned.